So good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation has been pre-recorded due to the time zone difference between uh, Cine uh, and uh, Boulder. Uh, and I apologize for this, but uh, feel free to contact me in, via email if you need further information or clarification. So today I will be looking at quaternary uh, biogeography from a ge geomorphological point of view, uh, looking at how surface processes might have influenced species migration across Southeast Asia. So this work uh, is based on a collaboration with several researchers from the University of Sydney and uh, different groups affiliated to the University of uh, Grenoble, Aix-en-Provence and uh, Paris. Uh, so before diving into uh, the core of the talk, uh, I'm going to do a quick presentation of the tools that we are using. And this tool is called Badland. It's an open source tool which is available uh, uh, from GitHub or the CSDMS uh, uh, model repository. So the tool itself has been designed to look at surface processes from regional to continental scale. And over the years, uh, new functionalities, uh, the functionality of the tool has been expanded. And here is some of the main components. So we have the ability to impose different precipitation on different conditions, uh, different tectonic regimes. Uh, we have a number of incision laws, uh, which go from detachment to transport limited. Uh, we are able to record stratigraphic architecture. And for the marine environment, uh, we have also designed uh, some uh, functions to simulate carbonate platform generation, wave-induced sediment transport, and gravity-driven uh, submarine currents. So, uh, as mentioned uh, in the tool's title, uh, we will focus on Southeast Asia uh, and looking at the evolution of the Sanda shelf over the last million years. So, the Sanda land is of particular interest uh, to biogeographers uh, for its position at the junction between the Australia Asian and Indo Malay zoogeographic zo provinces. Uh, and the regional species diversification uh, is that actually attributed to several uh, biologic and abiotic factors. So here we are going to focus on, on abiotic factors, uh, but several uh, studies have already been uh, done uh, in the region uh, to, for example, uh, look at the impact of, uh, of climate or volcanism, um, but also uh, obviously sea level, uh, tectonic, uh, and other, uh, and all this uh, might have uh, contributed to species diversification. Uh, one factor that clearly impacted uh, the a quaternary biological diversification of the region has been the eustatic sea level fluctuation, uh, mainly due to the geodynamic stability of the Sunday shelf uh, during the Pleistocene, um, and also the shelf physiography, which is character uh, characterized by its low elevation and low relief. So in that sense, the speciation uh, would increase uh, during ice then, and species dispersal uh, will occur during those then. So this alternation uh, will have remodel uh, the taxonomic composition of the region, and uh, sea level oscillation uh, will, cross, will act as a species pump to increase the regional uh, terrestrial biodiversity. Um, however, new findings have challenged this idea uh, and the idea of the prevalence of the aesthetic control, and have demonstrated that the Sunday shelf was uh, subsiding uh, during the late, late Pleistocene, and that basically. Uh, uh, the shelf was permanently superior uh, before uh, 400,000 years, so uh, around like MIS uh, 11. Okay, so these results were presented in three different papers uh, from Antaclaris and Laurent, uh, who are co authors on this talk. Uh, one looking at the geodynamic and tectonic evolution of the region during the Pleistocene, and the other looking at reef morphology and subsidence rate across the Sunday shelf. So if we are going to consider that Sunderland was actually exposed for such a, if, sorry, we consider that Sunderland was actually exposed uh, for such a long period of time, uh, with intermittent flooding only occurring during the last uh, 400,000 years, uh, basically the role of sea level is called into question. So it suggests that additional factors are likely triggering the distribution of, uh, of uh, Sunderland biogeography. So here we are going to evaluate if surface processes uh, could be one of these uh, uh, drivers. So to do so, we, we first created uh, our initial uh, and uh, forcing condition for our numerical model. So the region is characterized by several large river systems, uh, the main one being the Mekong, Yoro, Siam, and East Sunda river basins. And we created our initial pilot topography and drainage system uh, based on available uh, data set from either phylogenic studies 
looking at freshwater fishes, uh, such as the work from De Boon 2013, but also looking at uh, uh, well logs and seismic studies uh, available for the region. Uh, then after we imposed a climatic condition uh, uh, to, to, to simulate uh, you know, precipitation, uh, and we use the Paleoclim dataset uh, available from Dornetal uh, 2018. Uh, finally, we have also uh, tectonic forcing, uh, so uplift and subsidence rate, which were constrained from regional tectonic studies. And we also tested a bunch of two, actually, uh, aesthetic sea level curves. Uh, and then we performed a series of uh, multiple simulation, but four main one uh, where we vary this uh, forcing condition. So one with no tectonic forcing, one with an uplift to uh, uniform subsidence rate of 0.25 mm per year, as suggested by paper from uh, Anta Claris and Laurent. And then after we use our tectonic map with the two different sea level curves. So for each simulation, we first analyzed the flooding history of the shelf, uh, and we extracted the percentage of exposed shelf over time. And we found that uh, expo we found that we found that except for the stationary uh, case, which is this black line in the graph, uh, the shelf was fully exposed uh, prior to 400,000 uh, years, like uh, in agreement with previous work, uh, where sediment bypass the shelf and accumulate it in, in accumulate in, in distal offshore region uh, during low stand and uh, and during marine translation, basically sediment fluxes are mainly deposited on the shelf, which act as a sediment think, a sink. So after 400,000 uh, years, what we see is that marine incursions across the shelf are highly uh, variable and depend on the simulated scenarios. Uh, even when considering the sea level curve with the highest amplitude, so the red, la red line here, the flooding of uh, more than 50% of the shelf uh, only happen uh, less than 20% of the time. So for uh, all tested scenarios with imposed tectonic forcing, uh, we also see that land bridges between Borneo and uh, surrounding region are disrupted on several occasions. However, the terrestrial connection between mainland uh, Asia and Java is preserved and persists up to the Holocene. So these results basically contradict the sea level into species pump hypothesis often used to explain this, uh, this species diversification uh, found in the region uh, since uh, 400,000 years. And it suggests that additional uh, mechanisms are driving uh, dispersal and divergence of, uh, of species in the region. So the next things we did was assessing the region geomorphological evolution uh, by analyzing the characteristic of the main catchment and detailing the major phases of drainage basin reorganization. So first, we looked at the temporal change in catchment area, main river length, and uh, shelf aerial elevation for main uh, drainage basins, as shown in this uh, figure here. So for all the forcing condition, uh, we found that there is a, a, a clear relation, uh, as shown by this uh, by the Pearson uh, coefficient here, the negative uh, Pearson uh, coefficient here, between uh, sea level fluctuation and catchment uh, characteristics. Okay, uh, when we uh, looked at uh, cases where uh, tectonic forcing is considered, uh, the Sunda shelf experiences at least one phase of uh, drainage basin capture uh, of the Euro and Siam catchment. For the model which is presented in this slide, we see that there is a different fa phase of reorganization. Uh, so first, uh, we've got the Siam and West Borneo uh, basins which are experiencing uh, two capture. Uh, we also have the Johor River, which is cap capturing neighboring headwaters from the Siam basins. And uh, finally, uh, we see that a large there is a large capture of part of the Siam headwater uh, by the East Sunda basins. So in previous studies, physiographic changes were not, uh, account uh, not accounted for. And here we show that these changes could be critical to uh, some species, especially when considering a uh, lowland freshwater, uh, freshwater uh, biota, uh, which has the ability to migrate across the shelf uh, from Southeast Asia to the Malay Peninsula, uh, Sumatra, Borneo, and Java. And this just by uh, looking at how uh, river uh, captures have, uh, have, have been uh, organized over time. So we can postulate that successive phases of basin isolation uh, by fragmenting the habitat uh, could actually foster uh, speciation on the endemism 
and biodiversity across the region. So uh, we also uh, looked at, uh, from our landscape evolution simulation, we also tried to quantify the impact of geomorphology uh, by extracting uh, three main uh, 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 landscape features. So first, the landscape elevation connectivity, uh, the closeness to river, and the local slopes. So these features were chosen as they are common metrics to evaluate the impact of landscape and species dispersal and migration. And from these three features, uh, we produce cost uh, surface maps, such as the one presented here, that represent the cost required to move across different parts of the landscape. And we use this surface map in a connectivity model, which is called circuitscape, uh, to find a preferential paleomigration uh, pathways over the exposed shelf. So the approach is species agnostic, uh, agnostic uh, assessing only the contribution of geomorphological properties and ignoring, you know, ignoring other biotic or abiotic factors. Um, so the output from the connectivity model shows a current distribution or current flow distribution, uh, which can be related to ecological processes. So in the figure uh, uh, that you see here, uh, the current flow distribution has been normalized uh, using uh, the Z-score uh, statistical parameter. Uh, basically, what we've got is highly constrained region, which correspond to the high Z-score, okay, or yellow region on this map, uh, which represent preferential uh, corridors for species movement. Uh, and in this corridor, in this region, even a small loss of area uh, will uh, disproportionately compromise uh, connectivity. Okay, and such be and, and thus be uh, critical regions for uh, species migration. Um, so during a shelf exposure, uh, like in the middle figure here, uh, we, the region is characterized uh, by uh, mid elevation, uh, narrow high current flow pathways, which follow the Yoho and the Siam main uh, paleo drainage systems. And these pathways form a continuous migratory uh, corridor across the shelf. So during partially flooded periods, which are the one on the right and left, the shelf is characterized by an extended region of high connectivity, which are limited uh, to the Malay Peninsula mountain range to the west and the shallow marine incursion to the east. <coughs> so I want to stress the fact that our approach is, is not based on macroevolutionary models, uh, such as the one available, for example, with the Spaces Evolver, Evolver component of Land Lab, or the more recent work that has been proposed by Stokes and Perron. Uh, so to look at evolution of specific aquatic species uh, under different physiographic changes, these two approaches might uh, provide better insights than the one which is proposed here. However, one of the advantages of the method here is that we are not limited to aquatic species first, and it is uh, easy enough to change or add uh, to our cost surface uh, to reflect either additional factors or species-dependent uh, characteristics. So finally, uh, from these current flow maps, uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, we are able to perform a hotspot analysis uh, where we basically superpose uh, each time slice in order to evaluate persistent corridors over geological timescales. So our combined hotspot maps uh, shown here uh, predict that hotspots are preferentially uh, located across the uh, paleo yoho and Siam Basin, so that's the red uh, uh, region here, and cold spots are located on the shelf edge and eastern side of the region uh, between Borneo and Java. So this geomorphology control hotspot region uh, basically highlight a network of preferential, well-connected uh, biodiversity corridors uh, that could favor species migration between uh, the different uh, regions of, of Southeast Asia. And uh, in summary, uh, what we see from the study, we can explore, we basically we explore a new way of looking at species evolution over geological time scale. And we found that uh, physiographic changes might be one of the key drivers which are promoting the quaternary pump, species pump observed in the region. And we also believe that accounting for this regional scales, uh, landscape dynamics would improve biodiversity studies in the future and could help uh, find past uh, biodiversity hotspots and species migration pathways within this region, but also other places on Earth. So I would like to thank you for your attention and I wish you all a great CSDMS uh, 2021 meeting. Bye.